All right, good evening. Welcome back to Cultivating Connections. We're here with you on Sunday evening, um, and we are bringing you several guests tonight to talk a little bit about a program that's been going on for several years uh, that typically centers around our national convention. But as you heard last week, um, some changes have been made for this year, given our um, continuing concerns about the COVID uh, pandemic. And so um, that is being limited to only delegates and officers and spouses, um, which means that people who normally would serve in our youth uh, junior roles and different things like that uh, won't be able to join us. And so that also uh, extends to things like the fellows program. So um, first I wanna introduce some of the folks who are on with us tonight, all of which have gone through that program. And then I wanna talk a little bit about what it is uh, and have them talk a little bit about their experiences um, and then talk about what we're looking to do with this in 2020 to 21 to keep it viable. So um, I'm gonna put us in gallery view so you all can see their lovely faces. We have uh, five guests with us tonight. First, uh, Debbie Jaguer from Wisconsin. Hey, Debbie. We have Nick Oliver from Washington State. Hello. We have Phil Veneta from Pennsylvania. Good evening. We have Carrie Blassengame from Illinois. And last but not least, we have Susie Ram from Oregon. So Hello. welcome guys. Good to have all of you here. Um, so the Communication Fellows Program is something that uh, we've had sponsored by several different um, groups over the years. And uh, it's an intensive program that's hands-on and teaches some basic communications skills that Grange members can use to elevate the profile of their Granges in their communities and um, their state Grange and prepares them to also provide some assistance and training to Granges around them so that uh, we're kind of boots on the ground uh, across the country. So um, everything from how to structure and write a good press release or newsletter article um, to some social media best practices um, are part of that program, but it's a whole lot more than that. We've kind of evolved it over time, and I think our guests will be able to talk about that. So um, I get to do the interviews tonight. I'm really excited. Normally, these guys are doing the interviews of folks because they're used to that. Um, I'm going to actually start with Debbie Jaguer. I'm going to start with her because um, Debbie was part of our pilot test guinea pig program back in 2012 in Boise, Idaho. So Debbie, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Don't hear you, Debbie. We're, we're trying. Oh, I'm, do I'm doing good. How are you? Okay. We don't have any volume on Debbie. So we're going to give her a second to get her going. I hear her. So I hear Debbie. In 2013, Susie and Carrie in 14 and then beyond. And then Phil, you were last year, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Debbie, can we hear you now? I, we can't everybody you but now. you. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, we're here just fine. All right. So let me uh, change tactics a little bit. Um, we'll go to 2013. Sorry. Nick Oliver was a communications major in uh, college at the time. Um, ah, now I can hear Debbie. I apologize. <laughs> I'll say we all can yeah. hear you. You couldn't. Uh, yeah, it was on my Everybody end. Kidding. I had an error pop up on my Zoom. I apologize. So I had shoot all the other boxes away and didn't realize I had an error. All right, Debbie. Sorry. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so you're part of the Hello. Uh, and you stuck with us for several mm -hmm. years. So can you talk a little bit about um, what drew you to the program and what you kind of learned out of it? Um, well, the reason I became interested is um, uh, my daughter and I had recently joined the Grange um, about a year or so before uh, the Boise convention. And um, I think Lexi was still at that age where probably not send her off on her own. And we didn't know a whole lot about Grange. So we decided to jump in with two feet and come and figure it out. And um, what a way to figure out what was going on in the Grange by becoming a communications fellow. That's for darn sure. Um, but um, I think what made me stay was not only just um, 
the fun of um, going to a convention, right? That's fun. But the people that you meet and then so many things that I have learned over the years, um, being the communications um, fellow and then um, ultimately being like the senior communications <laughs> fellow for a number of years. And um, yeah, I think it was, it was, I learned a lot of good skills that just helped me sort of validate um, my volunteer job. I was actually able to put a name to it. And so that when I applied for a job at the Department of Agriculture in Wisconsin, I was able to say that, you know, I have been this national community. Oh my goodness. Get him <laughs> out of here. <laughs> that was my husband. Hello. <laughs> um, but I um, was able to put on my resume that I was a National Grange Communications Fellow, which was able to um, kind of, you know, just validate all of the skills that I had learned um, from being Communications Fellows for so long, which now I've, I'm actually, I do them in my job. I write press releases for my job. I talk on the radio, I, I interview and I give interviews. So all of those things that I was able to learn through um, hanging out with Amanda all those years um, really has kind of come back full circle for me. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I would still like to be a communications fellow, but I'm, I'm the, I'm the state master. Promotion. Yeah, you got a promotion to state master. So, state master, so. <laughs> and and Ann uh, Bercher from Minnesota got a promotion to state master recently, so she can't join us. Um, Let's see, Nathan Strotter has served as a fellow and state master. Uh, TJ Malaski has served as fellow and state master. So we've got a number of you guys who, not because of the program, but just in general, um, kind of were on track for leadership in the Grange and then um, kind of transitioned out of being able to help us out. So it's exciting. Um, Nick, Phil, and Susie, I think you all have in common that you were communications majors or uh, had, have a degree or background in communications from college. Um, so I think that the program probably caught your eye because it was already up your alley. Um, but I'll start with Nick because you were doing this concurrently um, while you were in school. Um, and you were, I think, a sophomore when you... Yeah, it was my freshman year. Okay. So um, I was hoping that you would talk a little bit about what you were learning in school and how, uh, you know, the program helped either reinforce some of that or provided you kind of skills-based learning that you were able to take back to your classroom. Oh, well, 100%, I'd say everything I did, I um, had some type of valuable skill to pull away and use for the rest of my college career. So um, uh, it, it gave me a huge step going into, because uh, like I said, I took it my freshman year. So by the time I got into um, my junior, senior year, and you're really taking those, um, your core classes, I, I had already had experience interviewing people. I already had experience having to having to approach that age barrier. There's a lot of college kids where just in the peer interviewing thing, um, they feel awkward going up to someone that's a little bit older than them just because there is that age barrier. And um, I had to walk up as a 18 or a 17 year old kid saying, Hey, uh, uh, state master from New York. Uh, you're seem like a really cool guy. Can I ask you some questions about what you do on your weekend? You know? So it was like, um, I learned a lot of schools like that, but then also um, I hadn't even touched at the time, any of the typing or like press release stuff that we were doing. And for me, I was able to take that back to um, my college radio station and apply it immediately toward awards and stuff like that and um, use it for things that helped me out more than what I could have known. Because there's a whole bunch of times where I'll be going through my resume on whatever checkpoints. I'm like, oh, well, that started with the fellowship program. Um, a huge thing the fellows have done since I was in it, I'm sure they still do, is that I think is invaluable to anybody who's going into media is that pure aspect of um, – the DIY, the do it yourself to it. So it's like you're recording it, you're editing it, you're relying on this group of people to edit it for you. And you have very real deadlines like you would in any other, any other situation. And, uh, but it's all in a very low pressure area. And to me, that was the best experience for it because I had a cool place to learn and kind of make these mistakes and kind of um, talk to people who also, the thing I love about it is that, um, the uh, age difference you have in it. So you're getting kids like me that are just getting to college. And then you have people like Debbie who have much more life experience than I did just on the end of knowing, like I said, the people skills of it. So it's, uh, I learned a lot from just the people I met. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't have enough nice words to say about it, honestly, because I, so much I did, like even now, if I look back through, I have my folder of 
assignments you save from college or like things you know you're going to use it, it was mostly from there like my ap style guide i used my entire time during college is all tapped up because i got to learn from you or people like cindy and people that were in the area that had journalistic uh skills that i would never know or experience that i wouldn't have so i got just the peer talking to people of everything there's so much i could have learned um if you have more specific questions maybe i don't know <laughs> yeah i'll come back to you in a minute with a couple um, for sure well, you were a couple years out of school by the time that you uh, did this program, same as Susie, um, and you are doing some of this in your day to day, but specifically, um, you also had done other things at the national level in the youth program. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how, how coming in with some of that knowledge was helpful, but how that, that may not have been all uh, important at that moment, because I think a lot of people might assume that you have to come in with that knowledge and then also why it's different from the youth program right um so i am the manager of our theater company so i do a lot of press releases and talking to the press via the radio doing television contracts all that kind of thing um the one time that i think you called me out on being a communications major was we did a, a pre-convention team challenge in creating a nutrition table for what it looks like to be a Grange member um, and what our team thought it would look like. And I sent it in and I had it all formatted and somebody made a comment of, wow, that looks just like an actual nutrition table. And I said, well, yeah, I looked up the style guide for what uh, a nutrition table would look like. And I think you were like only a communications major would think, oh, let's go to the style guide. Um, but that was, that was the, the end result was that I was able to turn there, but that's not where we started. And so it starts with the communication among one another. Uh, what are we thinking? How are we going to approach this? Um, what's, what do we want this to look like? What do we want it to feel like? And what do we want the end result to say about us? Um, and so that those kind of things are important on both the interpersonal communication and then um, the external communication on how we talk with as a group with one another and then how we present that to the world. Um, so that's where my uh, being formerly in the youth program, um, I had been there, when did I first start? Uh, Nebraska, I think was my first national session. Um, and I did Nebraska in DC as a youth officer. I did uh, Seattle, not Seattle, that's not where we were. Spokane. Wherever we were, Spokane, that's where we were, Washington. Uh, it's all one place, right? Um, <laughs> hey, first um, of all, no. <laughs> it's the best state in the conference. We're going to talk. Okay. <laughs> um, so Spokane, I was uh, part of the Horizon Youth Leadership Team. Uh, then in Vermont, I was the John Trimble Legislative Youth. And then finally, became a communications fellow this past year in Minneapolis. And the nice thing for me was that I had seen... Um, national session from a variety of angles. And I had gotten to uh, build relationships with a bunch of people over the past five years before I came in as a fellow. So when it came to interviewing and being able to find the right people at the right time for the right story, it was pretty easy for me to be able to jump and say, yeah, I know that state master. I worked with them last year on a committee. Let me go talk to them for a second. Um, or to send somebody else the same direction where they're like, I don't know who I should talk to about um, this agriculture story I'm doing, who's the best person to talk to. And for me to go, oh, you probably wanna to talk to Kevin Cooksley right now because I know that he's on that committee and he's the best person um, to answer that question today. But it was also, um, it, it was challenging at the same time because you know, I sat in with the communications fellows a couple times in Vermont and again, um, I had popped in and out when we were in Spokane. So I had done a little bit of writing, but suddenly having these deadlines that I wasn't used to as part of the youth program um, and being like up until 2 a.m. to deliver the papers, it was just a new experience, but it, it's so fun to be able to have this tight knit team. Um, I mean, we were elbow to elbow in this past year's communications fellows room up until you know, one in the morning every day um, for a week and a half almost. And so to be able to develop those relationships and to now have this web of people nationwide that are all writing for Good Day Magazine that we're all able to bounce ideas anytime when Amanda's like, I need a story, who's got one? And she's able to shoot it out to us and ask us. And we've got 
this web that we're able to help people find these connections still nationwide is pretty uh, pretty cool. And, and I think it's one thing that the Grange really has going for it is that I've got these connections from Washington to Florida to Maine, um, all over the U.S. And that's been part uh, partly because of the youth programming as a national uh, youth officer, as a Horizon Youth Leader, and then up to being a fellow. It's really built these um, relationships that, that I really cherish. Thanks, Phil. Um, Susie, you also were communications major, like I mentioned, um, but you now work as the Oregon State Grange editor for their paper. Um, and so I wanted to ask you kind of a tricky question, which is um, they teach you a lot of things in uh, college. And I think you all are gonna laugh at this, but when you get in the real world setting, sometimes either that's idealistic in the view or that's just not the way the world really works. Um, and especially in Grange world where we know we're working around volunteers, we're working around folks who may not have um, the same set of skills, deadlines or expectations. Um, so I'm wondering what you got out of the program that um, you went, wow, they didn't teach me that in school or boy, that's on point that other people need to know if they're gonna do a job like mine. Um, well, um, I came into the program, um, I just had been out of college for a year, my second round of going to college. Um, and I had been hired to the Oregon State Grange and one of my jobs was to do edit the bulletin. It's a twice a, or every other month issue. And um, just, you know, I would say everything, everything with deadlines. Uh, when you're working with volunteers, well, if they don't produce, what do you do? <laughs> There's not a lot. It's not like, okay, your job's on the line. No, your job's not on the line. Um, I still spend a lot of time discussing with them about the difference between first person and third person. Um, the size of the photos, you, you're taking a picture on your phone and it defaults to the smallest size. Well, the smallest size is not printable. Um, and, I, and, you, and I spend a lot of time teaching, which nobody ever told me I was gonna have to teach anybody anything, um, but teaching them how to send the stuff to me, get it in to me. Um, I have, in my state, I have 12, 11, 11, I guess, directors of different committees, um, education, agriculture, that. And some of them are really, really good at getting me to the dead on the dead by deadline. Some of them I prod often. And you know, you're thinking, I shouldn't have to prod them. They're adults. <laughs> They're older than I am. Um, but I found for me, I had been, I'd probably gone to national a dozen times leading up to uh, being a fellow, uh, but it had always been basically in the youth program, even though I was no longer a youth, it was in the youth program. Um, I had once, I had, in 81, I was Oregon South Young Granger and competed in the princess contest, which you guys all know as ambassadors, but we were prince and princesses. And um, and then it was public speaking and sign a song and national youth officer and those type of things. But I that was where I had seen it. I had not spent a lot of time in convention. I certainly didn't see the stuff behind the scenes, um, you know, and I know now for my job, it's great. You know, if I have a question about the egg, something the egg, I just call Burton up and or send him an e actually send him an email, I don't call, we're two hours too different. Um, if I send him an email and say, I don't understand how this works or what can we do to do this or, um, Right now was the postal one. It was so good to get that information for a call to action because that I didn't have to write it. It came and I just plopped it in my paper. Um, but yes, I, I can. I know all kinds of people like Phil talks about, you know, you know, all kinds of people now, you know who to go to for to get answers. Um, awesome. Thank you, Susie. Hey, um, Amanda. Yes. If I may pop in, sorry, I didn't mean to add, but to that point, one of the things that the fellowship program taught me, which I feel like a lot of younger kids my age have, um, it's like asking for help, asking for resources. That's a huge thing I know kids my age have an issue with, but like, uh, like he was talking about earlier, when you're in there every night from, you know, till one for a week straight, you kind of get buddy, buddy, and you're like, okay, I need this, who has this? So 
uh, just getting that like you're not asking for anything you're asking for a source to help get the job done like that was a huge skill and trade that i learned coming straight out of the gate from the experience awesome thank you i wouldn't have thought about that one so that's a good one to add um carrie you are are bringing up the rear for a second here but that means you get two questions um carrie was 2014 and then came back as a senior comm major uh, or senior comm fellow and that means that she helped kind of lead and teach the next groups um so i'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that concept of you know the peer-to-peer -peer, um because you know it's very hard i think for people to just uh come in who don't have a background maybe in any of this and feel like i could do this because some professional is teaching me having another peer teaching them, I think, you know, is important. So if you could talk a little bit about that peer to peer um, teaching and, and stuff, and then the mentorship that goes into it. Uh, yeah, so I was in a senior fellow in DC, and then again in uh, Vermont. And uh, I think it's helpful when like, uh, you can tell somebody, oh, when I had to write a story like that, and give them ideas on how they can start, where they can go for answers. You've already met some of the people because you've been there before. Um, like we've been saying already, uh, you, you meet so many different people uh, through the program that, um, that helps out. And um, it's easier to, sh to like teach and show someone how to do something than it is to just you know, say, oh, well, write me a 50 word, whatever. And what was the second part? Uh, the mentorship that goes into the program, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. <laughs> uh, I don't know, but like, I don't know how other people see me as a mentor. I always think that I probably am not the greatest mentor so I'm not sure I don't know about that I, I think we have some people who might disagree uh <laughs> unfortunately none of them from those two years where you were senior are on here but that's okay well no um, but I, I'm going to pop in and say that it's comforting as a fellow as somebody who's in the program to know that Carrie's there and that Debbie's still at session and that there are plenty of people who have been through the program who if you are busy Amanda that we can't get to you at the moment to say, to go to one of those other people and, and ask a quick question and say, what can we do about this? And, and it's great, like Nick was saying, to not be afraid to ask for help when we need it. Um, th that there are so many familiar faces now out of the Comfellow program who are represented at the national grade and in their state ranges in so many various ways that it's nice to know that those people are still around and still there to offer their help, even if they, like Carrie says, even if she doesn't know how, you know. <laughs> I think a good joke has been that the fellows room seems to attract the alumni network back um, because about Tuesday or Wednesday, they realize you guys have been there for four or five days come in and they're like, so what do you need help with? And I, I think that that's a really <laughs> cool thing um, to watch. So, um, that alumni network thing I want to talk about in a minute, but I was going to just carry the second question that I was going to ask you. And then I hope you guys can pitch in if you have any. Um, suggestions is we, the range is for all ages, but a lot of the programming at national is junior or is youth or is, you know, a more senior element of our group. Um, the fellows program has had that age variety. I think Debbie Lexi at the time was probably the youngest uh, or Katie Kaberski that we had in 2016. Um, and Carrie, your last year doing senior fellow so far, um, you had an 84 year old member who was very technology challenged. So I was hoping that you could talk about that uh, age and each of you, you know, feel free to chime in after Carrie and how that variety of knowledge and skill set that comes in is um, actually really useful to understanding what we need to do as Grangers to help the promotions. Well, when we were in Vermont, um it was Paul, right? Uh, yeah, he was like the best one, but it's so much fun because 
when somebody doesn't know something that you think that you know fairly well, like Facebook, I think I can do Facebook fairly well. I'm not maybe the best, but when somebody who's older than you, but has no, absolutely no idea, it really opens your eyes to like, he had, he did not have a Facebook page. He did not have, um, he had, we had to keep remembering his email password so we could send him things. And I think we ended up creating him a new email because we wrote down his password for him. He was so interested in the stories that he was doing and he brought such uh, a different angle because he was seeing it from a different point of view. And it was a point of view that you might not have thought of. And once we showed him how to um, make friends on Facebook, he went to town. Like he took, he took off and he was friend, friending everybody. And then we were finding posts and we're like, whoa, 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 slow down, slow down. And he's like, no, 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 I'm going. And, and he went. And um, the year Katie was uh, a fellow, like she would ask a lot of questions about different things that, uh, she was doing and it was the same thing you know you just show her what you know and then she would teach you what she thought worked better and then you would learn something at the same time. I think that discussion among the different ages has also been really interesting because for example Nick you know who is not technology challenged uh, might have a frustration why can't these people do whatever or wh why how do I explain this to somebody? And they had people in the room that actually needed the explanation. So you were almost testing some of that out. So Phil, I see you had. Well, I was just going to say, it's also interesting um, the way that uh, understanding the way that we all um, across age ranges approach social media. Um, this past year we were running, you know, the, the national Grange Snapchat or the Instagram story for the day and those kind of things. And um, explaining to certain people, you know, how to, is it a professional tool or is it a fun tool? Um, are, what are we putting out? What kind of content are we creating and what kind of image are we putting out about the Grange? And it's okay to have the fun things in there and it's great to have them in there because it keeps people interested. But every once in a while, it does have to be a news source too. Um, when we are you know, sitting in session for the day and are supposed to be putting things out about that. So even among, um, people younger than me, people older than me, it's, it's interesting to come together and, and just make those decisions on what's this gonna look like today. Um, hey, Amanda, to the same point where you're talking about um, the age ranges, I think um, one of the unique things that the old is that, um, like you said, a lot of the programming or a lot of the stuff that goes on the national program, it's like the youth or the junior. So it's usually, and it's, somewhat age group based so like for me there's a lot of times where um i want to go back to the national trip to the national and make the trip again and be part of the program but i think in that 25 to 35 year age group if you don't have a family sometimes i think the fellows is the best thing for you because you're you know you're involved but you're not that's sort of that age group that our organization kind of i'm not going to say lax but there definitely could be some boosting for that age group i think and i think the fellows you don't feel out of place. You feel involved. You're in the business. You're in the energy. You're getting to know. So, to me, that's what it is for me. It's like if I stay in the fellows, it's something for me to stay in the organization that I love, kind of a thing. If that makes sense. Um, Debbie, you you have been with us from the very beginning, so you've seen us go from you know five people sitting in a room, learning, training, doing, to one year where we had 20 um, and, and exactly what I was talking about with the people coming in and out of that room and introducing themselves and saying, I was this year and I was this year and I did this and that. Um, and now this is what I'm doing with Grange. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, that alumni network that's kind of uh, started and maybe your experience with bumping into other people who, or, or talking to other people who have thought of going through the program or have gone through the program and what that's looked like? Well, I, I think no matter what year you communications follow, I mean, we're all one big group. So um, 
you know, I, I was in the past two years, but I, I met the last couple of teens. Um, and actually, uh, somebody came and got me, I, being a master, came and said, hey, go ask Debbie a question about something or whatever, just because, you know, I am an alumni and like Phil was saying, you know, still there to be supportive, but, um, you know, I think like all of, all of these folks that are on this call, um, I either was on a team with them or um, from being part of a team. And um, I think that the alumni group is, um, I, I mean, even now I, I could call up Carrie. We've had an experience together and we, well, we don't live that far apart from each other, but you know, I could call her up because we've had that connection. We stayed in a hotel for 11 days and you know whatever the same thing with Susie if I had a question I could give Susie a call just like I had just seen her yesterday you know it's because we've had that experience together um you know I see all of you guys you know we're friends on Facebook and we can make comments and we can still talk in between times and still have um you know personal conversations and um it's just that you we've just expanded our network of friends and family. And I feel like, you know, no matter what year you were a com fellow, it's just one, one big family. And I wanted to just kind of make a question, uh, a comment about the generations. Um, this group is exactly what we're striving for in the Grange, trying to get young folks involved and get them interested and get them connected to something and get our older members, um, to understand technology and the way that things are moving and happening today. And like this program is perfect for all those ages in between. Um, you know, like Paul, he could show every person, no matter what your age is, you can get a Facebook account. And to, you know, Lexi and Katie, the youngest members, they can edit video and they can edit audio, you know, and so, um, and be able to, who, no matter your age, take those skills with you and be able to share it with other people back in your community. I'll let you guys jump in if you want about the alumni stuff. That's for anybody. Susie, I see your mute is off. Well, I, I was gonna say, I was just thinking about uh, a couple years ago when Oregon hosted the state master, the master's conference and you know, the one of the, I, Debbie and I was doing some of the pickups at the airport and it was like, oh, well, I want Debbie. I want to be there, <laughs> you know? Um, and then, the, yeah, and we talked about all kinds of things before I took her to the hotel, yeah. Um, but yeah, I feel like if I had a question about, um, you know, how I was how to, on hosting of a convention or something, you know, certainly Carrie's, I could just pick up the phone and call Carrie she's been down that path. <laughs> yes, she has. Nick, you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I mean, to the point where you're talking about the alumni always make their way back. Um, I came back the following year as the ambassador for my state. And uh, that was the first place I went. Because before that, when I was a fellow, that was my first national convention. I was like, well, crap, that's my group of friends. I need to go to them. Uh, so if nothing else, it was cool just to know I could go somewhere. And it was like, hey, I've been in this war room. I have a group of people here. And then on top of that, um, I like much like, uh, like uh, Debbie was saying, sorry, uh, you know, like your friends across Facebook, your friends across social media, you keep up with. And it's always cool to see like, oh, Debbie's doing this. That's awesome. She was on this radio station. I, or she was doing this. She posted this on her Facebook. I remember when I was asking her about my news release. So it's cool just to know you have that network in your back pocket kind of a deal because I mean I always have questions I mean I still reach out to Amanda sometimes like hey I have this for professional advice kind of a thing so for me that like the generation wise that's what it is for me knowing I have people I can reach out to for professional advice or life advice or anything like that. So I see you're unmuted. Yeah I was going to say uh, we've been fortunate from Pennsylvania to have a, a ton of communication fellows across the years spanning um, age ranges. Our, our junior director was a fellow when she was out in Washington. Um, so it was really cool this past year that the previous fellows were, you know, sending support to all of us and saying, uh, especially by the time you get to like Thursday, when <laughs> you're like, 
no amount of coffee is going to save you at that point, um, which for me is saying a lot. Uh, but it, it was nice to like get a quick little message from somebody um, or seeing like Debbie just pop down between when she had a couple minutes between session to say hi or uh, Susie popped in a couple times in Vermont, I think I saw around. Um, Cause that was when Vermont was when we were like down in the basement, they hid the fellows away from everybody. Um, and so it was nice that people take the time to come and recognize the importance of the program. Um, because without the fellows, Amanda, you can't keep up on your own with everything that's happening at session. So without this network, uh, the, the information from session would take weeks to come out where instead it's getting put out on Facebook and press releases are getting emailed and sent out within minutes after certain events finishing. Um, being able to Facebook live every one of those events um, creates a, a, a future network as well because people are saying, you know, I got back from session and people were asking me like, how did you do that? When, when did you apply? What was, the, what was it like? I think I might be interested in that at some point. Let me learn more about that program. So it's nice that we have this alumni uh, network who's willing to support the current ones and also encourage future ones, uh, future fellows to come through the program. I think I would be remiss if I didn't underscore how important this program is to me, um, both professionally and personally and to the organization, uh, at least, you know, in this specific part of, of the organization. Um, you know, for me, I, I was teaching uh, communications at the college level before coming to the Grange. And so I miss teaching a lot of times and this gives me that outlet once a year to do. Um, so, you know, personally and professionally, I really love that. Professionally though, I mean, we are all one person departments at the national level and there is so much ask of the directors so many different times. Um, and the idea of being able to write literally more than 70 press releases in one week, no matter how fast or good I would be at that, it's impossible. Um, and then to add to it, to put together a newsletter so every convention attendee knows what was happening at the different parts of session um, when they were in one of the parts and there was other things happening in other areas um, is invaluable. And then the last part of that is you guys have kind of all alluded to the fact that um, I'm able to pick up the phone and get the rest of my job done in any given week in the National Grange because I can say, for example, this past week, uh, a couple of you had still have access to um, certain roles on our social media. Can you please help monitor, you know, certain things because you're a few hours ahead or behind me, or uh, just generally having extra eyes on something sensitive? Can I bounce an idea off of you? How does this feel as other members? Do you appreciate the way that we've put this together or not? Um, and the magazine would be impossible without <laughs> impossible. So. Um, I, I just, that has been, uh, it, it wasn't built initially to be all of those things, I think, but it has become all of those things and a lot more. So um, I wanna talk for a second about the changes then for 2020 to 21. Um, and then uh, I was going to ask you guys a few more questions. So the changes for 2020 and 21, I think are, uh, it's important to say now before I talk to you guys about some other things. Um, we are going to do a fellows program that goes to span the two years, so 2020 to 21. The capstone will now be coming to convention instead of what had previously been, you come to convention several days in advance and we try and pack all of this training and knowledge into a couple days um, and then you're doing it all hands-on. And so we've run you for 18 hours or so for nine days in a row. Um, not that it's still not going to have a lot of work and a lot of long hours, but um, the idea is to be able to do a lot of this training digitally in advance. Or if we do have members like Paul, who's not uh, on the internet often or things like that, we'll be sending some physical, uh, you know, readings or uh, instructions or PowerPoints that are broken out or things like that. So there'll be the learning element ahead of time. Then we'll have some of these group meetings where people will get to know each other and do small projects like writing their own bio, writing someone else's uh, press release and bio and those type of things to do some of that hands-on work um, and get some of the one-on-one -on -one mentoring uh, 
and editing and things like that direction from me, but also we're going to be hooking you up with some of the previous fellows that alumni network as mentors. Um, and so I am just putting these guys all on the spot now because my nickname is Demanda, um, but we'll be looking at a couple of our folks to ask them to be some mentors. Um, and then the capstone, having gone through all of that, will allow you that free trip um, to national session. By that, I mean we in the program pay for your hotel room, um, your meals, your registration. Um, there's very little out of pocket for that week. We pretty much tell you bring a couple dollars for the things that you want to do, uh, but you're given the opportunity to experience convention in full. Um, and it also gives us a little accountability for the folks who may want to come in um, and then get there and, and, you know, really get overwhelmed in the process. So hopefully it pulls some of that back and it allows you to have some really good hands-on stuff. Um, the other thing I should say is that this program has evolved. I was very blessed to be um, elected national lecturer in 2015. And I served for one year out of that term before coming back on staff. Um, and in that role, obviously I saw a lot of connection between communications and uh, programming. And then I also was working uh, on some membership stuff while we were uh, without a membership director for a while. And there's a, a whole scale and, and continuum that these things all fall on. Um, so the program has also, and I think from the start, Debbie, you might be able to, to start this conversation off. We don't just talk about communications. It's great to learn about that, but it's also really important to learn about your organization because um, there, there's a hundred facets of it and no one knows a lot of, you know, that inside baseball, as I call it, that inside stuff. Um, sometimes just because you're out doing good Grange work. And so we get to talk a lot about what the organization is, where it came from, where we are today, where we're evolving, um, what our roles are in that, in that type of thing. So um, I was going to ask each of you to talk a little bit about some of the things that you learned that weren't communications in this uh, and where you found that valuable. And I'm going to start with you, Debbie. There we go. <laughs> um, well, um, I learned so much um, initially because I was a new-ish Grange member. So um, my first year in Boise, I, you would not believe I learned so much that was like, you know, jump in two feet, learn about Grange. And here you go from people from across the nation. And I think every single year that I um, and even now I'm still learning now from the people that I um, communicate with and I hang out with and I talk with and the things that I do. But um, it just, you just get a chance to just know so many people and meet so many people and learn, you know, how things happen in Oregon compared to how things kind of happen in Pennsylvania and what we're doing in little Wisconsin. And, you know, you get a chance to talk, not just communications, but just hometown. Like what, what is your Grange doing? And you'd be able to get ideas um, to come home and, and utilize them back in your own home granges and your own home state. And so um, that was valuable for me because you were really tiny. And so it was like, wow, oh, I got to meet other people from tiny granges. Well, what are you guys doing? Well, I can probably get my people to do that too and get them pumped up. And so um, I think that uh, yeah, there, there's so many things to learn. Um, one of the other things I was going to just kind of mention from before was like the year that I came to convention as master, I went to the communications room because that's what I was so used to doing. And like, that was where, where my people were. But then when I was um, out on the delegate floor, I look around the room and I had made so many connections all those years of being a communications person because I interviewed a lot of those folks in different committees and because they were new masters and whatever. So it's like easing out onto the um, convention onto the, to be a part of the delegate body was super simple. I mean, for me, it was very easy because I already felt um, that I knew what I would, was expected because I've been kind of, you know, I've been learning about that. So um, communication fellow for me, the experience was just beyond measure invaluable for my my Grange life my professional life and you know I have a whole mess of 
friends now too, so. Nick, I'll go to you next. Uh, can you reiterate the uh, question just so I can answer it in a fully compacted way? Sure. Um, Sounds so semi-educated. <laughs> something that you learned out of the program that had nothing to do with communications that you found valuable. Um, there's a lot of them. Um, for me, it was kind of uh, like uh, like you said, you learn the, you, not only you get the history of the organization, you learn all of the um, context because as you're writing these stories, you interview people and uh, like Debbie was saying, there's I remember um, uh, I was interviewing the master from North Carolina at the time and he kept saying toboggan, toboggan, toboggan. I was like, what the heck is a toboggan? And stupidest thing in the world, but it's a beanie, like a cap for your head when it's cold. And so little things like that, like in Tacoma, it's, it's a beanie, it's a stocking cap, you know? So like there's stuff like that, anything from social references or like dialect that like you just wouldn't know and you get to learn to, um, even like coming from Washington, a lot of people know, you know, we have the most members, yada, yada, yada. But it's for me, it's interesting to see like, how is Wisconsin doing it? How is Pennsylvania doing it? When um, someone tells me, oh, you know, uh, over in, um, oh, uh, Mil not Milwaukee, where's uh, Kelly Farm? Where's it at? Minnesota. Minnesota, Minnesota. We had our convention in a barn. I'm like, I want to go to a convention in a barn. You're like, so like just cool stuff like that you learn there's so many different levels to our organization that you never knew. And then um, you get people that are into the ag or you get people that are into the unwritten work and people are into all this, the organization type of it. So it's kind of, um, to me, I learned so much more about our organization than I ever would have thought. I was like, Oh, it's more than just a bunch of people in a room with these sticks. It's more than just a, you know, like kind of like a philosophy, an underwritten philosophy through all it. like there's like economic factors, there's political factors. Like to me, it was almost like an introductory course to like, here's the bigger world in general. And like, if you're interested in going into journalism at all, I mean, that's kind of how it is. It's like, you'll dip your toe on something and then next thing you know, you're drowning in the pool. And to me, that's kind of what it was. It was like um, drinking from a fire hose. And that it was the perfect experience. Like I honestly, I'm glad I did it my freshman year of college. Cause it's like, if you can't, if you want to go into journalism or want to go into writing about something and having to put a lot of effort into something, if you can't do it for the passion and for the um, need that it needs to be there for this organization, then you're not ready for how little the actual field pays. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Uh, Susie, something that you learned about the organization or about that anything from the program that wasn't communications related at all that you found valuable? Um, I think, you know, slightly different, but for me, it was a confidence uh, builder. Um, to realize that I could step out of not just the communications and Grange history part that I'm into, but um, when the opportunity came to work with Joe as the regional membership, um, you know, it was like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm ready for a new challenge. And yeah, the confidence, you know, to take on another challenge that was different, um, but still within the organization. Awesome. Um, uh, Carrie. I think the biggest thing that I took away is we all think of everybody just as Grangers, but we forget that they have a different life. They have, you know, Debbie works for the <clears throat> Wisconsin Department of Agriculture. But even beyond that, you know, I once I met Debbie, I learned that she is huge in the National Junior Horticultural Association. I didn't know that. I didn't know a lot about NJHA, even though we partnered with NJHA for a number of years. And so I learned more about other things, even within my own state, like my state Grange master were, worked, she retired this year, but she worked for the USDA. There's so many of our members of our organization who have really important jobs that we don't even realize it until like we're getting ready to interview them and Amanda sends us to you know Phil Prelly go do an interview and I'm like oh I'm supposed to ask you what your what your job is and he tells you and you're like you says what 
can you say that again? And you're like, oh, yeah, he's really important. He's not just a farmer down the road. These are, everybody has a different job and it's important to learn what everybody can do to help you out. Phil? Um, I think one of the things that I learned is that um, we are uh, a cross-generational, cross-country, um, cross-socioeconomic order that we, the, the, the thing that I really learned is that the things that we have in common are more important than the things that we have different from one another, but it's important to listen to those differences. Um, I think some of the, the most meaningful moments to me at session are actually, you know, the five minutes before a meal begins um, and you're sitting around your table getting to figure out who you're sitting with that day and, and where are you from and what do you do and, and or the, the 10 minutes before you're allowed in the session door um, when you're standing there in that packed crowd of people and you just strike up a conversation with somebody beside you because why wouldn't you? Um, and you spend those 10 minutes listening and learning about, you know, somebody who it's their, their 30 second convention and they can tell you about things that happen, you know, before you were born um, in, in the Grange. And that's interesting to me is to, to hear why people have stuck around and to listen to their stories and take the time to get to know the people around you because the, the things that, that we have to learn from one another aren't on the surface, as Carrie was saying. We don't, we don't know what, what somebody's backstory is until you take the time to stop and listen. Um, and I think that's just important in, all, in life in general is, you know, I think we make assumptions about a lot of people and even, even like unconscious biases, things that, that we don't know that we have in our system. Um, so until we stop and listen to somebody's story, it, you, you have no, no reason to, to judge them on any, any level. I know that um, the other thing that we've tried to do is make sure that we have the national lecturer come in, the national communi community service director, the um, high priest of Demeter, uh, the national president. So you guys have all had kind of those individual one-on-one -on -one interactions or small group interactions with people in the organization who create the contests and programs, make some of the decisions, um, you know, have some of our board members have dinner with you and different things like that. And I think that that was probably also um, of some value, I hope, as well as, you know, we had things like a crisis communications workshop where we talked about what happens if you have a camp and a kid gets hurt and that goes into the press, you know, and uh, workshops on different um, writing styles, uh, a workshop from a White House reporter, things like that in the past. And so uh, I think that that's kind of cool experiences too. So I don't know if any of you have any specific one, either Grange person that came in and talked to you and talked to you really kind of openly about all the things um, or, you know, one of the outside presenters that you wanted to highlight. When we were in Lincoln, so this was many moons ago, it was actually a joint open <laughs> workshop with the communications department and the membership department um, that you and Joe both brought in uh, the social media coordinator for UNL. Um, and I, learned so much in that session that I was able to immediately take back to my work. And it's things like that I didn't know that you could do with Instagram um, and how to repost was just becoming a thing. And that was one session that I learned a lot and I could probably dig out my notes somewhere um, from that session. And I still have some of the apps that he recommended on my phone to be able to work as a team using the same social media platform without constantly having to log in and log out or, um, how to the, the kind of messaging and how to, to create a message because he talked about you know on Mondays we always post this kind of content and on Wednesdays we always have you know a feature on one of our students um, kind of thing so that was really important to me on, on how to curate content for your brand. Anybody else want to jump in with anyone? Anything? Nick? Um, it wasn't necessarily it was so long ago i'm sure there was a ton of great presenters but i remember one of the ones specifically and um i think something that the fellows did that uh i think gets lost in academia a lot is um 
the how much how much on the go you are and how much you're constantly reporting and i remember um the learning like you can i can write record edit and do everything all on an ipad or on an iphone and like this device in my hand i can do everything i need to do like that to me just having that one useful diyness says like let me do so much more like so i remember you you specifically like yeah, Nick, you can get this thing called iRig, record into your phone and do this and this and this and this. And a year later, I did that, recorded a band and got a national award for it. So like, just like the people you work with in like the national environment forces you to be resourcefulness. So like, that was one thing that, I don't know if this was the second year that the program was going on or what, but it was a huge of like, I don't know, let's figure it out. What can we do to figure it out? And for me, that was a big part of it. I remember being instilled from like you and Debbie and some of the other people that had um, been there from the year before. That was like, okay, let's figure it out. Let's roll the punches. So that's something that you don't necessarily get a good feed for in the um, academic field, but right away it was like, like I said, jumping into the pool. So, um, and I have to say that I learned things from you guys a lot. Um, Debbie yesterday just told me about a program that she used uh, with Allison Dairyland, um, and she, you know, gave me an idea for what we can do this year at session. And by we, I actually do just mean me this time, and I think I'm having more of a problem with missing my fellows this year than anyone else, but um, you know, how we can broadcast that session uh, live to people. And so, you know, it's been really cool to watch you guys go out and um, learn and do in, in different things and then come back with suggestions and ideas that, you know, are restrictions. You already have an idea of what the job looks like and what we're doing uh, or what we've tried and hasn't worked for one reason or another. And you might say it didn't work that way, but it could work this way. Or, hey, uh, I know you spend a lot of time on this. Here's a time-saving tool, or uh, here's just a new tool that's open. Uh, it's cheaper than the one that you use, or it's got all these other features or whatever. And that's been fantastic as well. Um, so I got I have two other questions. Actually, I have two other things. Um, and then I will let us close up. Um, I don't see any questions from the audience yet. I'll remind you at this point, it's about that time. Um, but I'll just ask you guys each um, for a PG fun moment that you wanna share because we've talked a lot about the work of the program um, and work is a dirty word sometimes, um, but all of you clearly came on here and, and keep doing different things and certainly the friendships, the things that you've talked about but I'm wondering if there's just one like thing that you can remember uh, where maybe you were delirious by Thursday afternoon and you're laughing about. So um, Nick looks like he is totally ready to go, but PG, please. Oh, 100% PG, 100%. Um, so I only say this just because you mentioned Debbie and for the life of me, this is how I associate every Wisconsin Grange member. Uh, it was probably second or third day of the week and um, I was across the country in Ohio or some of the time. And at that year, for whatever reason, there was nobody with Washington. And I just was like, whatever. She said, well, Nick, come back to the, ho come back to our hotel room. We got a bunch of stuff, you know, it's everything's, we're not too far away. So we had a bunch of bring stuff over. We got cheese, like, oh, real Wisconsin cheese. And from this day on, I've never known this was a phrase, but it's not a party without Havarti. And this day on, anytime we're going somewhere, like, Oh, should we get a cheese platter for this uh, Grange banquet? Does it have Havarti? Because it is not a party without Havarti. <laughs> and I always quote Debbie in it every time. <laughs> so that's my, I, there's tons of them, but if you want a PG story, it's not a party without <laughs> Havarti. <laughs> nice. Phil. Uh, awesome. Yeah, this past year, um, my <laughs> sports and Druber was six months pregnant, I think, at session. Um, and it got to Wednesday night, and it was freezing cold in Bloomington. And somebody said the word ice cream near the fellows' room. Not even to the fellows, not to us. And Maggie and Lindsay and I were working, and she just goes, you want to get ice cream? I was like, yeah. And we looked at the clock, and it was like 9.55. And the um, Dairy Queen that was across the parking lot closed at like 10. So the three of us like ran out without our coats or anything because they were back in our hotel rooms to get over there. It was freezing cold, but it was exactly what we needed at that moment was just to get out of the fellows room, to have a bit of a laugh as we ran across the parking lot. I think it was like 
15 degrees or, or less outside um, and probably snowing because I think it snowed every day in Bloomington. Um, but it was great to just be able to laugh and, and have that kind of connection with one another as we went running across the parking lot. Carrie, I was thinking of us roasting in Vermont as he was talking about freezing in Minnesota. Vermont was, uh, it was, every time I would go outside, I would go outside in just my sweatshirt because it was colder at home than it was in Vermont. And every time I'd go outside, they'd be like, you're going to catch your death of cold. And I'd be like, it's like 45 degrees out. I'll be fine. I have a sweatshirt on. And that room was about 97 degrees. Oh my God. There was no problem with the heater or the air conditioner. No. And there was a fire behind us. If like an electric fireplace, if we ever got cold, we could just turn on the electric fireplace. And in five minutes, the room would be warm and you could turn it off. Susie, I'm sure you've got something fun. Um, <laughs> it's been a while. Um, I was thinking about, you know, all the little animals. We were at Sandusky and there were African type little elephants, you know, elephants and monkeys. And so there were always pictures, you know, taken and they'd be somebody's arm draped over something or some animals draped, but that kind of fun, fun types of things. Debbie, I'm just waiting for you to come out with the small animals now. Well, um, I, you know, I guess I am thinking about all of the conventions um, and with all of you, like I've been with all of you from um, being locked in, not necessarily locked, but kind of locked down in a hotel that has a big water park and we never stepped our toes one time in the water. Remember that Carrie and Susie, we walked past that so many times and we're like, we're at no. a water park. We never even went, we never got our suits on. No. Lindsay and I went swimming the last day. We had to okay. go and get new bands at the front hotel desk because we had the wrong color. And the lady's <laughs> like, when did you get these? And we're like, the day we checked in. And they're like, when was that? And we're like, uh, 10 days ago but we did go for like 30 minutes we went in the hot tub and we went down one of the water slides and that was it and then we came and changed and packed all right so the last thing i was going to say is i also um, go ahead no sorry i was also just going to say i uh, i love our picture from um from new hampshire um Right, right, right. Is that where we were? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> like they all start to blend together, like that large group and how we, um, we got to spend good dinners together. Um, we've had times where we had a kitchen and Lindsay baked us cookies. And, um, another time when, you know, somebody, a uh, Granger in the neighborhood brought food over to us. And so, um, just, memories of walking half asleep delivering uh, newsletters under people's doors <laughs> um I, I just want to ask a quick question when you were a communication fellow sorry you cut out a lot debbie what was that oh i was just gonna say how many of you uh, still have some newsletters from when you were a communication fellow some of the articles that you wrote yeah. They helped me graduate. <laughs> I've got all of mine in a binder from um, Vermont and where, where, Minneapolis. Oh my God, I'm losing my mind. Um, uh, just because they're very useful tools as we're anytime we're, if we're looking for a new job, anything that I've written for a good day, I've got saved. Um, just to say, look, I've been in these national publications and it's because of my involvement with the Grange that I was able to do that. Yeah, I was gonna say I've got my whole bunch of mine in a box called portfolio. Maybe eventually they might get in some organization to them, but yeah, I have all of mine. 
Um, I have one I'll share that's probably interesting. <laughs> I have one that I specifically keep because it was the first um, like writing piece the mandate handed to me, and it was about Chris Hamp from our state. And she's from my own state, and I've known her most of my life. And sure enough, I just it was had a couple mistakes in it, and Chris Hamp called me out on it, shaked your finger at me, and I've kept it because ever since I've learned so many lessons from that one moment. So that one paper is one of the ones I hold on to is like fact check everything. <laughs> Nice. So the last thing I was going to do is you all um, have learned some fantastic interviewing skills. You've mentioned it over and over. So I'm going to turn the flo floor over to each of you. Um, you are welcome to ask me anything that you want, or you can ask somebody else something. But uh, I just thought that that would be a fun little twist to end our evening. So um, hopefully it's fellows related, Nicholas. Oh, yeah, no, this is actually a good one. So um uh, for those of you who don't know, I work at a radio station in Seattle, and um, while it's not as classically journalistic as uh, some of the other people here, um, one of the things that I find interesting is that um, the more and more social media becomes uh, prevalent in our daily lives, and the more and more social media is just part of our, the world in general, uh, it seems to be taking up a larger chunk of the journalistic space. And one of the things that's been interesting to me is... Um, in an organization where a giant chunk of the of our base doesn't deal with that and as we're seeing just with events in the world social media is becoming more and more an important tool of that um i guess is there a way that you see the fellows trying to lean on that importance at the same time spreading the good parts of it within the grange or, or how do you see it fitting into that program does that make sense yeah it does um so for me i think because social media takes up a lot of my my time um, between... Like, are we going to get a national master TikTok? <laughs> I don't see a TikTok anytime soon. Um, for example, we do have a Snapchat. We don't use it, really, because it's not a really effective platform for us. And even though it is the platform of a generation, there's very few things that feel authentic enough for us to put up... Um, on a Snapchat platform because Snapchat has its own voice, its own tone, its own characteristics. It's very uh, photo based and we don't have a ton of things that we do at the national level. That's what you guys all do. Um, so actually it's a more effective tool for a local Grange to use and a local Grange that has a young element or at least um, kind of a young image. And so you'll notice that we don't use that platform, even though we certainly have locked down the, the uh, username and stuff like that, just to make sure that we own that space. Um, but we use Facebook a ton. And actually, strangely, we mentioned that while social media isn't well used for you know an older demographic, actually Facebook uh, is pretty well used and then that demographic is the fastest growing. Um, but more than that- Max. <laughs> but more than that, we have 3,515 people who like our Facebook page, and we only have about 4,800 emails. So I've almost caught up to the number of people we can reach by email, as I have for the number of people I can reach on Facebook, theoretically. I mean, we know that the algorithm doesn't always put us at the top, and they don't always see us and everything like that, but realistically it's almost as important in some ways as our email blasts to make mm -hmm. sure that our communications on Facebook are appropriate. And then you add that multiplier effect in social media that you have, where if I'm on your pages because it's posted to, to the National Grange, you can share it and you are sharing to a whole audience. Let's say you have 600 friends and 400 of them are not Grangers. Um, you shared it to 400 people I wouldn't have touched, probably more than that, because probably not all of your Grange friends have liked our page. And so the multiplier effect is there that's not really there with email. So um, yeah, I, I think that we lean into that space a lot. Uh, we talk a lot about why we choose certain platforms and how there's platforms I can't choose for us, or at least I can't effectively do for us that I could teach you how to do locally. Instagram's also kind of on that vein. Um, and how to make that look better. So this past year, we talked a lot about the app Canva, which I've done a little bit of instruction on even here, um, because it makes things look more professional. So 
that's a that's my spiel on that. <laughs> Anybody else want to hurt? Yeah, I'll ask. Um, so, although you're going to be a, a one woman band at session this year, um, as you open the 2021 class of fellows, what are the three most important traits or skills that you would like that class to, to have or to embody? So the first thing is curiosity. I mean, I know that that sounds silly because it probably should be love of the Grange first and things like that, but there is something that you're learning in this, even if you came in with a communications degree, uh, you know, or a job in the field um, or skills in the field that you are going to learn. So you have to not come in um, saying that the way I Grange is the only way that Grange can happen. The way I do communications is the only way communications happens. The way I interact with my members is the only way someone should interact. So curiosity to find out who's doing what, what's effective, um, you know, and, and how things can work differently, even if you don't implement it, because then you'll better understand why Pennsylvania is doing this and why Wisconsin's doing that and uh, how it works for them. The second one is, I, I think, you know, a specific work ethic. I mean, this is volunteer for 99.9% .9 of the people involved in Grange. Um, my efforts, you know, get me paid, but then I go to Grange and I do my volunteer work too. So, um, so you have to, at some point decide it's not a job and it's not paying, but there is certainly um, a responsibility if you're taking part in a program like this um, and learning some things to go back and help. And so you're, you're adding to your load in some ways, a few extra hours somewhere um, to either help some of the other members in your state or your community to do better in communications. So you're adding work to yourself. It's not just those nine days of convention or the weeks up, up before. Um, and you're kind of committing a little bit more to the organization because like I said, you guys are, are my base. You are my department and I, we couldn't function without you. And that means the Grange doesn't do well without you. And then the last thing I think is um, you have to be committed to the fact that the Grange must continue, that Esto Perpetua is a thing. Um, we all know that the, there are struggles in every organization, especially membership organizations. But if you're willing to say at the end of the day, maybe Grange doesn't need to be here or I'm not worried about its continuation after me, um, you're probably the wrong person for the program because we do talk a lot about what are we doing to make sure that there's more people who are able to be part of the organization and continue it. And what are we doing to make sure it continues? Like making good decisions, challenging, you know, the ideas that are here, um, supporting the ideas that founded us, those type of things. Anybody else? Everybody's silent. I Carrie? have a question. How many, uh, Vic, I mean, participants are you looking for for the 2021 uh, fellows class? You are trying to get me in trouble with my boss. <laughs> um, because she always says like four, Amanda, or six, Amanda. And I'm always like, well, but we can fit like 14 in that room. It's fine. Um, so... I really have kind of figured out that the ideal class has about six to eight brand new fellows. And I really like the eight because frankly, I just like to make sure we get en enough people trained around the country. And then it has two to three senior fellows. One person who is kind of the taskmaster who makes sure we get everything done that we need to do. Because while that's part of my job, I'm running around with my hair on fire doing a lot of other things. So that person, and that person also typically double duties, um, either as kind of the, the shoulder to cry on the mentor, the, just the gut check for everything, or um, as an editor of some sort, um, having an editorial eye. And then somebody who's doing uh, primarily either our social or our photography stuff. Um, and the last one is somebody who can really make sure that um, we've got everything we need uh, technology wise, 
you know, in place and everybody kind of in their spots. That's not so much the task massacre. I know it sounds kind of the same, but it's not. So I normally like three seniors as well. So that would put us at 11 or 12 or so people. <laughs> Ish. And are you looking for them to come from each region? So I have um, some specific states that we have never had fellows from that I'm really interested. I have uh, the first fellow ever who's applied from New Hampshire. Or, well, the first person to apply this year um, was from New Hampshire. I've never had a fellow from New Hampshire. Um, so that uh, that's exciting to me. Uh, there's a couple states on my list that uh, I will be reaching out to those state masters and specifically saying we'd love to have somebody from your state. Um, so there's only a few of those states left, which is great, but yeah, it's really important. And this is, it is a competitive program. I should say that, um, not everybody who applies gets in. In fact, you know, it's typically about half. Um, and so it's important to me to make sure that there's a dynamic of, um, you know, skills, term length of time in Grange, because it's really important to have some of those eyes that aren't so weary, you know, so used to Grange. That's why like Debbie coming in to a group that had been seven generations in and just strong help was so good um, to have the different uh, abilities and technology, you know, ex life experiences, those type of things um, to be there, so. I'll ask this, um, cause I think I might've missed it kind of at the beginning, but it's probably a good way to sort of re-wrap up again. So um, people have applied already and um, they'll be kind of hanging out with you for like this next year to come back into the 21 cycle. And yeah. so are, are you gonna let people, are you gonna, are you looking at having like a year long training or something that's gonna be happening this whole entire year now? Yeah, so this will be a little bit different than I think what we're gonna do going forward. Um, this will start earlier, I guess is what I'm saying, because normally we would probably start in about January or February, run through to the November convention. Um, this year, because we can't bring you to that convention in November, we're probably going to start earlier and, and just have a little bit more playtime, a little bit more fun, um, and be able to start that in about September and then run through next November. Um, and it gives us more time to have some of this mentorship stuff and everything like that and be a little less intensive because everybody's lives are a little crazy right now. So I think that that's appropriate. Um, the other part of that is we have had some people apply because they know about the program and they grabbed last year's application and they've already sent their stuff and the application won't really change much except for the explanation of what we're doing and timeline and things. Um, but the what I would say the corrected updated now uh, 2020, 2021 application will be going up in the next week, week and a half on our website. It'll be out on our Facebook. It'll be in our patrons chain. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping that you guys as seniors are going to hand it to somebody who you know should probably be part of the program. Um, the other thing is this program requires a, a letter of recommendation. It can come from a state master, it come from a national officer a national staff member or a former fellow. So all of you guys can write a letter of recommendation. And frankly, I like those because you know a lot of times what it, it means to be doing the program, even if it's a little different this year. So um, that that's weighed really heavily into it. So if you're interested in the program, find a former fellow. They can tell you if, if it feels like a fit, but they can also write a recommendation if they feel like you're a fit. So. Anybody else? All right. Well, well so, go ahead, Nick. Well, so since I know that, uh, I'm now taking applications for uh, recommendation letters, $5 a pop. Uh, we'll start the highest bidder. <laughs> you know, Nick, your sense of humor really helped the uh, tense times. So I'm just going to say that that is also, it's not one of my top three, but it's certainly on the list <laughs> of things that we need somebody in that room to have good comic skill. Um, you need a cheap laugh guy. Yeah, that's true. So, all right, well, I think we've covered a lot of this. I'm really excited to get the, the changeover a little bit in the program. I actually think it's gonna be very, very helpful. I'm really excited to have some of these folks mentor some new people coming in. Um, I'm excited to get applications here coming in soon. We should have that application deadline early September. Um, so you have a little bit of time, but hopefully not a lot or late August, um, we're figuring that out now. 
And so um, look for that information coming out. Guys, thank you so much for everything, frankly. Um, and it's, you guys are a small representation. We've had like 49 fellows over this program period. So um, the ones who, who didn't, you know, come on tonight because we just didn't want to overwhelm the system. Um, you guys are just as incredible and amazing and helpful. And I am so thankful, honestly, for every one of you going through the crazy. And the additional thing I should say is um, most of you, except for Debbie, um, heard about the long hours, late nights and hard work and still came and sought this out. So um, that's a heck of a statement of character. So thank you guys for that. Hey, oh, I, I knew a clue. Yeah, Debbie didn't know about it, but then she came back multiple times. I, I invented some of those late nights and then continued to come back and enjoy them. And um, before you go, I just want to say, hey, Carrie, Susie, Phil, and Nick, i saying hi to you guys because I have not seen you guys <laughs> for a long time. So hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much. Um, we look forward to everybody tuning in tomorrow uh, for Cultivating Connections. We are doing this live every day still. Um, and if you have any suggestions or comments for additional ideas for future programs, we're looking for those. So make sure to put those uh, in our Facebook comments or send them to me. Have a great night. Thank you again, everybody. Bye.